Hi community, big, big welcome. My name is Kristen Skelton. I'm the founder of Bud Funding. And today I'm gonna dive right in. I wanna talk all about how to control pests in your garden. And I have a special guest back with me today. You probably seen her before if you um, have been on the Bud Funding channel. Um, in the past, we've done interviews on composting. And so you can find, I'll link all the interviews in the description of this video so you can find those uh, interviews and to access that great information. So Kathy Parsons has been a passionate advocate of no dig gardening for more than 25 years and planted her first urban food forest in 2008. Kathy, thank you so much for joining me again. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Garden season is well underway and that makes me happy and super happy to spend some more time with you and your group today. So let's dive right into the first question. What is, from your experience, what is the simplest way to remove pests? Um, mostly, most of my preferred methods are mm -hmm. what I guess would call, I would call it mechanical. So, um, you know, picking bugs or setting up traps of some sort or something like that. So that you're, um, you know, specifically targeting, targeting what is a problem for you. Um, what I'm trying to think of what I've been, um, you know, trying to take care of lately. Lily beetle is a big one. So I have a couple of Marlagon lilies that I really watch for the lily beetle. So first thing every morning I'm out there checking to see what there is for lily beetles and I'll pick and, you know, remove the ones that I find. And, and that way then, you know, you're not um, harming anything else. Um, you know, there's various traps that you can create for, you know, depending on what the, um, bug is that's causing you the problem then um, you know aphids you can just wash off um, you know that kind of thing so um, those are my preferred method methods is to be very specific and targeted about what it is that I'm trying to get rid of some of your ground kind of um, things like onion maggots or carrot fly or um, you know the little worms uh, radish maggots whatever those are obviously you don't really see those until they're in the the um, crop. So those ones are a bit different approach um, that you would take. They're more preventative. But when you've actually got the bugs, I prefer a mechanical um, way of removing them. And how do you deal with pests in a vegetable garden? Is there a difference um, with a vegetable garden as opposed to just like a flower bed? Um, for sure, because most of the time, um, like in your vegetable garden, is going to be mostly either mechanical or a prevention of some sort. So if you're talking about something like uh, cabbage moss, for example, um, the best way to deal with that thing is just to cover your brassica crops with a fine mesh or a remake cloth or row cover, something like that. So the pests can't actually get in to become a problem. Um, same with... Um, um, apple maggots, um, even your radish, the worms that get into radishes or um, onion maggot, whatever. If you cover the crops, you don't have to worry about the pests because they're not getting at what you want um, to uh, protect. So um, in vegetable or in flower gardens, you probably um, maybe notice them less. It'll be more like slugs or maybe aphids, um, in some cases spider mites, those kinds of things. Um, again, it's just being observant and then you would, I would resort to mechanically um, removing those rather than having a prevention kind of method um, because it's, yeah, that's just kind of how it works. You have to excuse my throat. Allergies are really bad. Oh, no worries. <laughs> and yeah, it's... Uh, Drink water <laughs> as much as you need. <laughs> I get a little croaky when I talk. Um, and so... Is there such a thing as a natural insecticide? Um, I know you said mechanical, so that would be more of a natural way of, of getting rid of the pests. Okay. Do you yeah. have any other ideas of how to protect the um, plants from insects naturally? Um, one of the things that I really caution people about is when you're talking about pesticides, they're indiscriminate. So it's not mm -hmm. like you can find something that you can spray aphids for and it only kills aphids it's going to kill any insect that it touches. So uh, th those are really extreme measures in my mind because 
when you're talking about your garden, I mean, number one, you know, do you want to be eating something if it's been sprayed, even if it is something that's, you know, supposedly natural. Um, and the other thing is, is that I, I work really hard at building healthy, thriving soil. And every teaspoon of that soil contains thousands upon thousands of little critters, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, you know, whatever. And when you're using those kinds of um, solutions to spray, you're also damaging, you know, the other things unintentionally, but you need to be aware of using those kinds of things. And most of the time, either a mechanical removal or prevention are a far better alternative. If you do find yourself in a, in a place where something's going on, like my lilies for the first few years, I was very carefully using some diatomaceous earth down on the soil to try to prevent the lily beetles from coming up out of the soil. But you have to be careful that it, like the beetles will be affected by those and so lots of beetles are beneficial. Um, if there were flowers around, bees could be impacted by that. So I only use it in very early spring, um, when, before there's, you know, any bees or anything around um, and, and just very, very carefully and cautiously. So there are things, you know, like garlic spray you hear about or um, boiled um, rhubarb leaves. And I've tried a few of those things off and on, but typically very seldom do I ever resort to, to something like that because it just, you can't really control what it's impacting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I've had a couple people ask, what is eating holes in my plants? Is there um, any any specific bugs that just eat holes in the in the leaves? Typically, what you're going to find with holes is going to be something like um, maybe a moth or a, well, a caterpillar uh, of some sort, perhaps slugs. Um, neither of which are particularly beneficial, although the caterpillars might turn into some kind of beautiful moth or butterfly that we would want and are also pollinators. Mm -hmm. um, if they're perfectly round little holes, that'll be leaf cutter bees. So that's a native bee that we have, mm -hmm. and um, you definitely wouldn't want to be um, doing anything to exterminate um, any of our native bees. So um, those are probably the most typical um, that would be eating holes in your plants. Aphids and things you see either like blistered leaves or um, yellowing leaves. Spider mites are typically like a yellowing leaf. You don't typically see holes in the leaves. And what is eating um, plants at night? Is there a difference between night pests and day pests? Uh, yeah, typically at night what you would see is probably slugs because they don't like, you know, they like it where it's shady or dark or whatever. So they typically come out at night. So that would be the most common night pest um, that you would not normally see during the day unless you dig into their habitat. Um, and, you know, your day pests are more typically, you know, your leaf cutter bees. And, and I mean, aphids pretty much stick to wherever, you know, they'll glom onto a plant and kind of stay there. And, and uh, you know, they might move to a few other plants, but it's not really based on day or night. And is there anything else you can share from your vast knowledge on how to control pests in the garden? Um, probably one of the most important things that I, I kind of want to reiterate is the fact that there's no such thing as a pest-free garden, for one, and that everything is interrelated. And many of these pests are food for other things that we would consider to be beneficial. So, and, and we... You know, we try to discourage birds in our yard, for example, but they are huge insectivores, some of the, you know, species of birds. And you want to try to find a balance so that they're, you know, because I grow a lot of berries or whatever, and I'd like my fair share. I don't mind sharing with the birds too, but I want my fair share. So I don't want to discourage the birds because they're one of your primary reason or primary tools in pest management. They eat lots of mosquitoes, for example, um, would be a good one. Um, you know, robins will eat slugs and, you know, those kinds of things. So you want to try to find that balance because it's all nature is a closed loop system. 
So, and you can't, you know, you can't feed the birds and kill all the bugs. Like it just doesn't work that way. <clears throat> so you're trying to achieve a balance of some sort. And I mean, there are peaks and valleys and, you know, you might have a aphid infestation of some sort. So plants get infested with bugs when they're stressed. So you need to look for the stressors. Are they being watered too much? Are they being watered too little? High nitrogen in the fertilizer is often um, a, a stress factor that will attract aphids, for example. So if you're having some of those issues, by all means, you can treat them preferably by a prevention or a mechanical method, but think about why they're happening in the first place and what you can do to address that to prevent it from you know, continuing to happen. So think about those things that might be, maybe it's not enough light and some things we can't control. We don't get enough rain. Well, you know, you're gonna have to supplement watering if, you know, and in some cases, if you're on an acreage or something, it's not feasible to try to truck water out to your, you know, cherry trees or something. Um, so do what you can um, by um, managing as many of the stress factors as you can. Um, and I think there's a lot of, I get kind of annoyed to be perfectly frank with a lot of that natural kind of, you know, use this instead of Roundup or something like that. And you have to understand those things do still have an impact. Dawn is not an organic natural product on dish soap or any kind of dish soap. It's a detergent. It's meant to strip oil. That's not good for plants. Um, if you're going to have to use soap of some sort, use a Castile soap. It's an actual soap um, and make sure you rinse it well. Um, you know, using vinegar and Epsom salts and whatever, Dawn soap or whatever as a, as a weed killer. I've never found it particularly effective and it affects your soil biota with the, you know, the vinegar and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and Epsom salts is never good to put into the garden. Um, so really think about what's causing it and what, things you can do in your management to prevent it from happening and try your mechanical means of removing them. Um, you can also plant trap crops, for example. So um, there are certain crops that will attract aphids. So you might want to plant those over on the outside of your garden plot, like your veggie plot, and let the aphids go at that. And then maybe they'll leave whatever it is that you've had trouble with aphids on. Um, and you can use things like you know, marigolds and um, some of the onions and garlic and, you know, interplanting those things. Um, also think about not like doing huge rows of carrots and, and having them the same thing planted all in the same place, because that's when, of course, the, you know, a, a carrot fly is going to go, oh, lots of carrots. Or if it's interplanted a bunch of, uh, of a number of other kinds of vegetables, they might not even notice the carrots there and that kind of thing. And don't keep planting the same crops in the same place. You know, if you plant your carrots in the same row every year, you're going to end up with problems. So try to make sure crop rotation. And that's sort of that uh, companion planting that we talk about a lot. That's a big part of what companion planting is, is to bring a bit more diversity and in interplanting within a garden and to, to uh, introduce things like a marigold, for example, that might repel certain pests. You know, dill and lovage will help to repel tomato hornworm, for example. So planting a bit of dill and lovage within your uh, tomato plants. Uh, marigolds, I typically do those in tomato plants. So think about those prevention things. And then there's certain things. If you put brassicas out, they need to be covered or they're going to get cabbage bonds. It's just a fact. So do that work up front, get your brassicas out there, just keep them covered. And then, you know, the cabbage moth can go do their thing somewhere else. <laughs> and then they feed the birds and, you know, whatever. Wasps is another thing. Every, oh, kill them all. They're no, you know, they're not useful. They're very useful. And they're huge predators for things like aphids and, and those kinds of things that you don't want. So sure, you don't want a nest hanging on your deck or, you know, whatever, but leave them some space for them to have so that they can do the work for you in the garden and try to keep those things in balance.
because you know you don't want a thousand wasp nests in your backyard obviously but if there's a way you can manage one where they you know can have an area on their own they're tremendously beneficial to the garden so just trying to find that nature and realize that whatever method aside from like a trap crop or mechanical you might have unintended unintended consequences in your garden that actually create more problems in years to come because you've wiped out a predator population or you've wiped out food for the birds or you know whatever we want to try to find a balance where there's some but not enough to affect your crops or you can give up you know a few leaves on your rose bush because the leaf cutter bees really like them and we have leaf cutter bees right so <laughs> it's all kind of a, a big balancing act and um you know when, when figuring out what's enough and when you need to go to the next step and you know that kind of thing is just experience yeah, yeah. absolutely and everything is very very interconnected so um i i did see this one comment on the internet um that said how do i completely get rid of bugs from the garden and i was like i don't think you want that no 100 percent, you don't no and and i mean if you're going to be a gardener i mean there's bugs <laughs> right and and we just have to learn to live with within you know like some acceptable means so mm -hmm. I, mean, I typically very rarely have issues with aphids for example but when i do i'm looking okay that plant is stressed for some reason um so what is it is it not getting enough water with the weather that we're, we've been having, I don't know about you, but I mean, I've had one good rain this year. That's it. And it wasn't even, you know, it was more than a quarter of an inch, but not half an inch. That's all we've had. And so I'm looking at my plants, looking for drought stress. So, you know, are things slower leafing out? And I, you know, something like a current bush, when they get stressed, they typically attract aphids. So I'm looking for the blistered leaves on my current bushes and going, yeah, they need water, right? So, and trying to, you know, do that kind of management rather than, ah, oh, there's aphids, where's the spray can? Because then, you know, you just create, you end up, once you start using that, you just can't stop because. Yeah, and you're not, um, it's, you're not going to the source of the problem in a way. Exactly. You're putting a Band-Aid on mm -hmm. it that continues to cause other problems and I mean the, the number one tool you have is building good soil because then your plants are thriving they have their own natural ways of either attracting or repelling pests and if they're healthy and strong you shouldn't have nearly as much problem with pests because they're able to manage them on their own so you know there's there's all that and I mean it takes some time to get there sometimes but if you just keep on that path and, um, you know, always think of, of why it's happening, the mechanical way to, to remove them or to trap them. And nine times out of 10, you're never gonna get to the point where you really truly need to spray. You know, you can, uh, I've had, uh, when I first transplanted some cherry trees, they got cherry aphids. I just sprayed them with the jet hose every day for about a week they were all gone and in the meantime I, I felt it was you know some drought stress um stress in the spring so that was watering them and um you know helping to alleviate the drought stress and you know the aphids moved on and i've never had them since so mm -hmm. um it's you know it's trying to maintain the balance and not not go to the most extreme method first is really the best way to look at it and know that there are some crops you just have to cover them like the cabbage moths i don't know what they're like where you are but where i am they're terrible and you put a cabbage out in the deck just to harden it off and they're glomming all over it right like so they just need to be covered mm -hmm. And if anyone has any questions for me or Kathy, please put them below in regards to this topic or any other gardening topic. Definitely put them below and we'll respond to you as soon as we see them. But Absolutely. Kathy, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and your knowledge. I learn so much every time we meet. Super appreciative of you uh, joining me in these interviews and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with the Bud Funding community. Only happy to have a chat anytime, Kristen. Yeah. 
Well, thank you everyone for um, watching and joining. If you found value in this video, please like and share because that helps spread sustainability across the globe and um, it really helps everyone um, live a more sustainable life. So thank you everyone. I hope you have a great day and I will see you next week. Bye for now. Happy gardening. Happy gardening, yes. Yeah.